Hey everyone, this is David DeHilser. You may know me as the Dissident Science uh, YouTube channel guy, but I'm also now uh, also hosting the Saturday Science Chats. Franklin Hugh, if you ex if expect to see him here, he's been doing that for many years, so I'm giving him some t well deserved time off. But today we have a fantastic show. Today, I'm telling you this. I will say this. I can say it because it's my opinion. And, you know, I've been studying uh, expansion tectonics for a, a, quite a while, over a, over a decade. And I will say to you, in my opinion, and this is my humble opinion, we're going to be talking to the most important geologists ever. I'm not talking about of, of uh, how do you say, our generation ever. This book that, that uh, he just wrote, uh, I'll be talking about this a little bit. It is fantastic. But again, um, let me... Uh, Introduce everyone who is our on our Dissident Science YouTube channel who's not used to seeing this. I'm starting to broadcast live to Dissident Science. So all my subscribers, hello to you. Heck, I, it keeps growing. We're almost to 3,300 subscribers. I appreciate it. If you like these videos, please subscribe, hit like. We're broadcasting live to Dissident Science YouTube channel, to the CMPS YouTube channel, and to the CMPS Facebook. So I welcome everyone. And this is sponsored by the John Chappelle Philosophy Society and Dissident Science YouTube channels. We are, um, let me go to the next slide. Our CMPS, the Chappelle Natural Philosophy Mission, what, what, what are we as an organization? Uh, to be an organization that above all promotes critical thinking without malice, to be an organization that supports, publishes, and promotes serious scientific work outside mainstream science, to provide a forum for open debate about modern topics in physics, cosmology, philosophy, and mathematics, to provide a forum for presenting serious papers and theories without fear of censorship, to be run and controlled in its entirety by its paid membership, including the election of directors and its members. In fact, some of you who may know our, our organization from the older name MPA, we went through a restructuring, uh, and uh, that's why we started the CMPS, so that it would be truly um, run by our members. So here we go. We're going to keep going here. If you want to join our community and join in, you can go to our naturalphilosophy.org website and you can see there we have our um, uh, website that's brand new. It's just like almost like Facebook, but it's for scientists. We have lots of groups there, interesting groups where you can do, uh, where, can, where you can talk to people about uh, like interests. We have groups on spec expansion tectonics. In fact, you can see it right down here. Uh, that's one of the groups. In fact, uh, James Maxwell has promised me he will sign up and will be available for questions you have on that. So, um, and we also have other websites. Okay, just a minute. I'll be right back in a second. Quiet. I am sorry, I got a yapping dog there. <laughs> this is live TV, as they say, more or less. Okay, how to participate and support? Sign up on naturalphilosophy.org. You consider becoming a member. Our membership plays the annual memberships, our annual, and uh, they, they start at pretty reasonable, but they do pay for everything you see here. And um, <laughs> sorry about the dog loot, guys. Uh, but this is the real world we live in today, anyways. Everybody recognize that. It's. It's not easy doing this when having a yapping dog in the background. But um, participate in the community discussions on our website. Post news and happenings about us on social media. So you can do those things. Um, if you want to take a look more about what's going on, our websites, you can take a look at our community website at naturalphilosophy.org, um, our online magazine, sciencewoke.org. You can also go to our Wikipedia, which is the Natural Philosophy Wikipedia, which has over 10,000 pages. And coming uh, is our Chappelle University, where we're going to be teaching courses in natural philosophy. And those courses will be offered uh, for free. Uh, to be taught, and I'm hoping our guest today will start a course. I'm going to be working with him. Um, he's at that point in his life where he has to start teaching about what 
he uh, has given the world, which is amazing. Um, and today we're going to be uh, having a talk uh, by the premier person. This is this is a fact, the premier person in span expansion technonics. And in fact, I'm pretty sure James Maxlow is a a person who uh, the person who actually coined the word expansion tectonics. So um, if you don't know James Maxwell, he is a retired professional geologist who has worked as a uh, mining and exploration geologist throughout much of uh, Aust Australia. During that time, uh, he returned, her returned, I uh, changed this uh, just this morning, sorry about that. He returned to Curtin University of Technology in Perth, Western Australia to study and research expansion tectonics. From this research, he gained, a, I got this, he wrote this himself, I tried to change it, time, but sorry about that. For this research, he gained a Master of Science degree in 1995, followed by a PhD in 2002. So that's quite a, a, an accomplishment in itself. And um, if, you do, if you haven't and don't know about his book, uh, his latest book, in my opinion, the most important book ever written in geology, and I don't say that lightly, I honestly believe so. It's, it's, I think part of it, the reason is because he had to really write it all himself. And, uh, you know, he doesn't have an entire university and, and uh, how do you say, uh, uh, how do you say all the geological societies around the world and around the universities supporting this. So he's pretty much on his own. Um, and that's, Amazing how he put this together uh, with one person, but um, it's called Beyond Plate Tectonics: Unsettling Settled Science. Again, you can see sort of the idea that we critical thinkers uh, look for truth, and that usually upsets the uh, mainstream of science. I'll read a little bit be, uh, about the book Beyond Plate Tectonics: Signposts that this is something more advanced than basic academic courses might cover, while the subtle the subtitle of Unsettling Settled Science confirms our suspicions. The whole book is all revolutionary and new, unsettling to anyone who thinks there will be no more major revisions in the earth sciences. It is just as stimulating to those people who understand that, uh, that scientific discovery will never be finished. It's just as stimulating to those people who understand that scientific discovery will never be finished. And that's totally true. So, um, that sort of gives you an introduction to what we have today. And I have standing by from Perth, Australia. Uh, right now it's 10.08 10, oh, 10, oh, p.m. in the morning here in Florida. But in course, we have uh, James, Dr. James Maxlow with us. And uh, he is in Perth, Australia. And it is 10.08 p.m., correct? Correct. Well, welcome, James. I really want to thank you for uh, coming on here and actually speaking. Uh, he had mentioned that he was going to be speaking. He had to put together a talk today. And um, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be talking about. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, recent to Permian small earth modeling. Uh, during the um, research uh, years I did at the university that you mentioned, um, I was self-funded. Um, had very little help from academia, self-funded, worked mainly from home, and I purpose-built these physical models of the Earth using modern, um, modern observational data, in particular geological mapping of the world. Um, do you want me to? Sorry, David. Do you want me to start my presentation? Yeah, now? yeah. If you if you want to do maybe if if one of the things you could do maybe let's assume that a lot of people here aren't as familiar with geology. Maybe you yep. could put this talk into context for an uh, an average critical thinker like that yep. comes to our websites who love science. Put this in context. That way, when you start going with your uh, slides, maybe that will give them a better um, understanding of getting into the, this specific talk. Yeah, well, the the book, the the book beyond plate tectonics. There, really, um, I tried to dumb it down from uh, you know mainstream academic uh, papers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which don't get published. Any papers that I submit to the, the mainstream journals don't get published because it's just too controversial. Uh, so, in order to get this across to mainstream. I dumb it down so most people can understand what I'm talking about. But this particular book 
is directed mainly to, say, um, undergraduates and uh, uh, people with a bent towards uh, uh, natural history, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, basic geology. Um, it's it's uh, very easy to read. I've had some, some great uh, revisions on it and uh, great um, coverage from people who have read it uh, and find it very easy to read. But again, you do really do need some basic understanding of geology. And um, I'll, in my talk, I do go into geology, but um, I'll try not to be too academic. <laughs> so no, speak. no problem. No problem. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let you uh, go. I'm going to jump out of here. And um, if, if you need any help, I'll see. But um, um, thank you so much again. And uh, I can uh, say to people that his book is very readable, especially if you're a person who loves science. You can, you get the hang of it pretty quickly. Um, I mean, it's just so fascinating, the whole idea of expansion tectonics, that that excitement alone keeps you going. But uh, I read through the whole book, and it's quite easy to read. And I'm not a geologist by anything. So uh, thank you very much for doing the talk. And I introduce you, Dr. James Maxlow, on expansion tectonics, recent to Permian small earth modeling. Okay, thank you, David. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of a series of four podcasts introducing expansion tectonics. What is expansion tectonics, you may well ask. Um, David alluded to the fact that I actually invented this name, and it was invented, uh, originally invented as Global Expansion Tectonics, and it was the title of my master's thesis in '95. It's sub subsequently been shortened to expansion tectonics now. Expansion tectonics is primarily a geology-based tectonic modelling process which utilises modern global observational data to allow the Earth to tell its own story. My presentation today is based on 25 years of PhD and post-PhD research. This research has culminated in publication of a number of books, the latest of which as uh, David has pointed out, is called uh, Beyond Plate Tectonics, Unsettling Settled Science. In my latest book, I look beyond the achievements of conventional plate tectonics in order to show you a uniquely different way of physically modelling the Earth's ancient crustal plates. This modelling uses modern geological mapping of the oceans and continents in order to constrain plate assemblage and Earth's ancient radius back in time. From this small Earth modelling study, an extensive range of additional global observational data is then used to quantify the outcomes of this study. In this presentation, it is important to appreciate that what I will be presenting is a data modelling exercise, not a theory modelling exercise. In other words, I make no assumptions about the Earth and I do not apply any premises to the data. As all I will be doing is modeling global geological mapping and observational data without constraining the data to any preconceived theory. It is important to also appreciate that I am not modeling plate tectonics, so therefore I do not need to constrain the mapping or observational data to a constant radius Earth premise nor do I need to consider additional ad hoc constraints in order to make the data fit. All I am presenting here are spherical models of the ancient Earth to test a concept and to allow the Earth to tell its own story. In this podcast, I will be focusing specifically on modelling the seafloor crustal plates in order to create spherical scale models of the ancient Earth extending from the present day back to the Permian. This, um, this study is summarised in the first three models from the right shown on screen. Modelling beyond the Permian back to the early Archean at far left will be presented in a separate podcast. The small earth modelling study presented here is based on the geological map of the world as first published by the Commission for the Geological Map of the World and UNESCO in 1990, shown here in Mollweed projection. 
This map is based on an extensive program of seafloor magnetic and bathymetric mapping, accompanied by age dating carried out throughout all of the oceans during the 1950s to late 1980s. For those not familiar with the term plates, the Earth's crust is arranged in a series of seven or eight major and a number of minor plates. The outer edges of these plates currently coincide with the pink stripes shown in each of the oceans. These plates are made up of both continental and seafloor crusts and are generally centered over each of the continents. The colors shown on this map represent what I call time dependent geology, where the colored seafloor stripes, for example, represent the preserved growth history of each of the modern plates as basaltic lava is intruded along each of the mid-ocean ridge spreading zones. The ages of each coloured seafloor stripe coincide with the major geological epochs, extending from the pink Pleistocene stripe located along the mid-ocean ridges through to the blue Jurassic stripes, just here, located adjacent to the continents. What this means is that the yellow seafloor sea stripes, for example, located between the younger red stripes and the <clears throat> older orange stripes represent basaltic lava that was progressively intruded along the ancient mid-ocean ridge spreading zones during the Miocene epoch, extending in time from 5.3 to 23 million years ago, 5.3, 23. During that time, the younger red and pink basaltic rocks, respectively, did not exist. During the Miocene, the two adjoining yellow stripes were then joined together throughout all of the oceans and remained joined along their common mid-ocean ridges during this interval of time, progressively widening over time. Similarly, the colours within each of the continents represent rocks that were formed during the major geologic periods and eras, and coincide with the distribution of the ancient cratons, origins, and basins. What this modern geological mapping shows is that all oceans contain a mid-ocean ridge, shown here as the centrally located pink stripes in each ocean. The younger seafloor crust coincides with new mantle-derived basaltic lava currently being extruded along each of the mid-ocean ridges. In all cases, seafloor crusts increase in age away from the mid-ocean ridges, as shown by the symmetric growth histories and red directional arrows for each ocean. The oldest exposed seafloor crust for all oceans is early Jurassic, around 170 million years old, and shown here as pale blue crust located mainly adjacent to the continents. Of particular importance that all oceans are increasing their surface areas away from their mid-ocean ridges, as again shown by the symmetric growth histories and red directional arrows for each ocean. Putting aside any preconceived premises or assumptions, from this mapping data, it is logical to conclude that when moving back in time, all plate reconstructions must be reversed and assemblages must strictly adhere to the geology preserved in this map. That is, the geology must be reverse engineered back in time. In other words, all mid-ocean ridge basaltic lava must be progressively returned back to the mantle from where it came from. Similarly, all continents must move closer together in accordance with this preserved plate history, and in doing so, close off each of the oceans in the direction shown by the magenta arrows. So what does all this mean? In this animation, the geology map of the world is shown in spherical format. The globe will rotate a few times before removing each colored seafloor stripe in succession along each of the mid-ocean ridge spreading zones, simulating moving back in time. What I have done in this animation is to simply remove each coloured stripe in turn without forcing the plate data into a preconceived Atlantic Ocean assemblage. By doing this, the bedrock mapping highlights that 
In addition to the Atlantic Ocean, each of the other oceans can just as easily be closed off along their respective mid-ocean ridge spreading zones, and each adjoining continent can also just as easily be moved closer together. The point being made here is that forcing data into a preconceived Atlantic Ocean assemblage is based on a 1960s assumption that Earth radius and surface area have always remained constant. In the rest of this presentation, this assumption is simply ignored and the same modern plate data will be, will be reassembled on smaller radius Earth models in order to investigate what happens when we successively close off all the oceans along each of their mid-ocean ridge spreading zones. In contrast to constraining plate assemblage as to the Atlantic Ocean only, the small Earth models in this next animation will rotate once before removing each coloured seafloor stripe in turn and reassembling the remaining plates together on smaller radius Earth models. As can be appreciated, this represents a unique method of modelling and constraining this readily available geological mapping data. This animation simulates returning the intruded seafloor lava, as well as a proportion of the atmospheric gases and seawater from each of the oceans back to the mantle, from where they originally came from. By doing this, each of the continents are then moved closer together, in effect, reverse engineering the preserved growth history back in time. As can be readily seen in this animation, the remaining crustal plates assembled together on each successive model with a single unique plate fit estimated to be better than 99% fit. You will also note that each model has a north and south pole along with an equator scaled from these pole locations. These poles were plotted directly from the International Paleopole database of McAleeny and Locke, 1996, where each of the published poles plot as diametrically opposed north and south magnetic poles for each model, as they should do. On these models, by the Triassic period, continental and marine sedimentary basins begin to merge to form a global network of basins coinciding with relatively shallow continental seas. These marine sedimentary basins, shown as white on each model, represent a network of low-lying regions where the sediment eroded from the exposed land surfaces accumulates. Logic dictates that by moving further back in time, this erosion process must also be reversed and all young eroded sediments must be progressively returned to the lower to the former land surfaces. By returning these sediments to their former land surfaces, it is then feasible for the ancient earth radius to be further reduced back in time. An older continental crust more tightly assembled on pre-Triassic models. By continuing to model back in time to the late Permian period, about 250 million years ago, on this model, all young seafloor volcanic crust, plus most of the marine sediments deposited along the continental shelves, have been removed. The distribution of published ancient continental seas are also shown in blue, and the modern continental outlines are highlighted as black dashed lines. As distinct from conventional practice, what is shown on this model is that all continental crusts unite precisely with a single unique plate fit to form a global Pangaean supercontinent during the late Permian period at around 50% of the present Earth radius. Each of the small Earth models also show that large Panthalassa, Tethys and Iapetus seas, oceans rather, are not required during model construction. These oceans were instead replaced by lesser continental Panthalassa, Iapetus and Tethys seas, which represent precursors to the modern Pacific and, and Atlantic oceans, as well as ancient sedimentary basins located on many of the present day continents. On these post-Permian models, the transition from ancient seas to modern oceans only came about when the Pangaean supercontinent, 
shown here, first started to rupture and break up to form the modern continents and intervening modern oceans. It is envisaged that breakup then initiated draining of waters from the ancient continental seas into the newly opening modern oceans, plus expulsion of new waters from along the newly formed mid-ocean ridge spreading zones. The preliminary conclusions drawn from these increasing radius small earth models is that there is no requirement for random, non-predictable, multiple plate fit assemblages, assemblage options as ill-defined as or ill-defined plate histories. Nor is there a requirement for extensive, largely hypothetical ancient oceans to comply with a constant surface area premise or for the fragmentation of any of the modern continents to comply with paleomagnetic apparent polar wander studies. Instead, it is shown that the ancient continental crusts tightly wrap around and fully enclose an ancient smaller Earth. These continental crusts then assemble against continents that were otherwise not previously considered to be related on conventional assemblages, which in turn presents a, mul a multitude of new opportunities to study global data distributions. In addition to being able to assemble the mapping data on small earth models, the information contained on the geological map of the world provides a means to, to uniquely measure ancient earth surface areas and from this to derive ancient earth radii back in time to at least the Triassic period, some 200 million years ago. The results of this exercise are shown here in the form of a graph of ancient earth radius relative to ge geological time. And similarly, a derived formula for calculating earth radius at any moment in time. The red dots shown on this gra graph represent the locations of each spherical small earth model constructed during this research. However, in this presentation, I am only highlighting the past 200 million years of earth history as defined by opening of the seafloor crusts. The remaining models will be introduced in a separate podcast. The locations of each model constructed are dictated by the time scales represented by the colours shown on the published geological map. This graph shows that the rate of change in Earth radius over time is exponential, with rates of change varying from microns per year during the first 70% of geological history, increasing steadily throughout the remaining time to a rate of 22 millimetres per year increase in Earth radius for the present day. By extrapolating forward in time, it is calculated that the Earth will be of a similar size to the giant planets by around 500 million years into the future. From this graph, it is envisaged that crustal development is an evolving process intimately related to changing Earth radius, surface area and surface curvature over time. This process commenced during the early Archean some 4,000 million years ago, with an extremely long period of slow to steady continental crustal stretching. This stretching was then followed by a period of steady to rapidly increasing crustal stretching, leading to crustal rupture, and finally to break up of the ancient Pangaean supercontinental crust around 250 million years ago to form the modern continents and oceans as demarcated by the vertical dashed line. This entire process was unimaginably slow and protracted, matched only by the unimaginably long span of geological time available since original formation and stabilization of the Earth. To preempt your query as to where all the extra matter comes from, of significance to this research that in year 2000, four identical Cluster 2 satellites were launched by the European Space Agency. These satellites were launched to study the impact of the Sun's activity on the near-Earth space environment by flying in formation to gather data around the Earth. For the first time in space history, this mission was able to collect three-dimensional information about how the solar wind interacts with the magnetosphere, how it affects near-Earth space, 
and how our giant spherical magnet called Earth reacts with particles within the solar wind. This new information and related discoveries were considered by the European Space Agency's project scientists to be of great importance because they showed how the Earth's magnetosphere can be penetrated by solar particles. The Earth's magnetosphere is, is now shown to be full of trapped plasma, comprising charged electron and proton particles origin, originating from the solar wind as it passes the Earth. This flow of plasma into the magnetosphere increases with increase in solar wind density and speed, as well as increases in turbulence in the solar wind. In addition to penetrating the magnetosphere, it has also been shown that the plasma travels down along the Earth's magnetic field lines within the auroral zones, entering the Earth at each of the poles. This Euro European study suggested to the scientists that penetration of plasma may be a lot more common than was previously known and possibly represents a means for the constant flow of charged electrons and protons into the Earth. The most important question that should then come to mind is what happens to these electrons and protons, the very building blocks of all matter in the universe, when they enter the Earth? The answer to this question is, of course, that they must increase the mass and radius of the Earth over time. In summary, it is concluded that the global geological mapping presented here more than adequately demonstrates that a Permian to recent increasing radius Earth is indeed a viable and demonstrable tectonic process. From a geological perspective, at no point has any fundamental physical law been violated. The commonly held presumption that Earth radius has remained constant throughout time is simply removed and instead, the Earth is allowed to tell its own story. In order to create Permian to recent small Earth models, I simply removed from the Earth what was not previously there, introduced, intruded seafloor volcanic lava, intruded magma and eroded sediments, to end up with a Pangean Earth comprising a complete assemblage of continental crustal components. The seafloor mapping shown on the geological map, map of the world was initially used to accurately constrain the location and assemblies of all seafloor crustal plates on, a small, on smaller radius Earth models. Assemblage of these seafloor crustal plates consistently showed that each plate assembles with a single unique fit, with all plates assembling with a high degree of precision along each of the mid-ocean ridge spreading zones. It is considered that if these crustal plate assemblages were mere coincidence, it would be expected that the seafloor mapping, as well as geological and geomorphological, or geographical rather, evidence from adjoining continents, would not match across plate boundaries on any of the small earth models constructed. This evidence instead shows that seafloor bedrock mapping does indeed match across the plate boundaries. All continental sedimentary basins do merge to form a global network of ancient continental seas orogenic and fold mantle mount, mountain belts coincide and ancient crustal regions assemble together precisely. This assemblage of seafloor crustal plates was shown to extend for 200 million years back in time to the early Triassic period and demonstrate, demonstrated the viability and un, uniqueness of a post-Triassic small earth modelling process. The small earth modelling presented in this research then suggests that plausible alternative models and mechanisms based on the extensive range of modern global tectonic data and evidence must then be actively encouraged, not discouraged. In this context, we should then at least consider that modern plate tectonic observational data may well be better suited to an increasing radius Earth scenario before continuing to unscientifically reject this proposal out of hand. Modelling also gives encouragement towards extending small earth modelling studies further back in time. In my next podcast, I will be utilising continental geological mapping to constrain crustal assemblages back to the early Archean.
So thank you for your interest in expansion tectonics. And for those seeking more information, please visit my website or contact me at my email address shown on screen. Thank you very much. Over to you, David. All right. Thank you so much. I put the uh, website up there. Um, <laughs> this is so great. Like I said, I don't even care uh, if, if I give anybody a chance to talk with him because I'm, I, I have so many comments and questions. Um, great. I think that was a great presentation, especially for people who are really not um, real familiar with uh, what expansion tectonics is. Um, we do have some uh, a comment. Uh, here's Here's uh, from Ralph B. Excellent stuff. So uh, obviously uh, people are are enjoying this. But um, it I think it's most amazing to me, um, James, is that when I watch, if any if anybody wants to go and see how how ridiculous, um, no offense, play tectonics is. Go to the internet and and find. There's not many of them. I, I I've I've tried. There's not many. Um, how do you say um, videos or, or or animations or modeling of the plate tectonics movements? I have seen some of those videos. So you go search for plate tectonics, you know, shifting or moving, right? And I'm sure you've seen them. It is absolutely a a an exercise in farce. I mean, it is. I have never seen one of them that that makes any sense to me. Uh, have you seen? Ha, yeah, have you seen some of those animations? Oh yes, oh yes. yes. I mean, yeah. I think what what happens is is they have all this data, right? One of the things about mo what we call model revolution, Kuhn talks about this very cl clearly. We have normal science. There's model drift. We have model um, model crisis, model revolution, and then back to uh, normal science. Well, we have, you know, model, model drift. Now we have mo model crisis, because if you look at the data and you try to, uh, how do you say, um, match up all the data that they have on a fixed radius Earth. I've seen them, they, they'll, they'll have the components come together and they'll do this and then they'll, you know, because they're trying to fit in all the data that they have by flora and fauna and geological whereas for instance one of the things maybe you i'm sure you saw i saw i think it was last year wasn't it was recent where i saw all of a sudden all these articles about the western um no the eastern side of australia is matches up with the western side of canada the united states and that just dr drove the plate tectonics crazy how could that be i mean uh, how I mean, how, how do people come about, how, how do you deal with that? Because it's, how do you think these people even try to deal with it? They just have to close their eyes. I mean, after a while, you, you, you get so much data against it. You, you know, if I was a plate tectonics person or gel, I, I would just say, guys, this is wrong. There's something really wrong here. You're absolutely right, David. And as I'll, I'll introduce a slide in my next talk, which highlight some of those uh, assemblages that you're talking about. And plate tectonics really is driven by uh, paleomagnetics, uh, the study of okay. uh, the magnetics preserved in rocks. Right. And it, so it's, it's, it's out, of, out of the hands of geologists. And most paleo, paleomagneticians are geophysicists uh, to, a sort, to, to an extent with very little training and understanding in geology. Um, excusing some of them that are actually trained in that. But anyway, they highlight, they, they absolutely uh, use this uh, paleomagnetic stuff religiously. And you put a number of researchers together with the same data and they'll come up with different plate fits. Uh, what I emphasise in this, what I've emphasised in this talk and my next talk uh, when you use the geological data, mapping data, you only get one chance. You only get one fit. You right. don't get um, you don't you don't get um, the ability to move it around a bit and and assemble it somewhere else. You only get one fit. Every, each and every model that, that I construct is one fit. Whereas 
uh, plate tectonics, as you alluded to, there's a, a multitude of fits for the same thing. And the assemblage of uh, Australia, Eastern Australia, towards the west coast of um, the, the, the North America, uh, that comes naturally to expansion sure. tron- tectonics. And as um, uh, a number of my colleagues have, have uh, uh, mentioned, have, have mentioned this uh, um, in a number of papers, that uh, plate tectonics, plate tectonists got very excited about this um, assemblage of North America and um, West Australia. And as you well know, I used to live in Brisbane. And when I visited you in Vancouver a few years ago, um, what, 200 million years ago, I could have walked there. Exactly. <laughs> I was going to say that. I was going to say, man, it would have been much easier and much cheaper to get you there. Well, but Brisbane, they, they, so, yeah. Brisbane to Los Angeles, I think they were, they were <laughs> within walking distance anyway. But right. yes. Uh, Yes, it's it's it constantly amazes me um, uh, <clears throat> about people who um, don't look beyond these cartoon recon- re- assemblages. Yeah, of plate it's it's just it's just ridiculous. Here we're gonna we got a bunch of questions starting to come up here, and I can see on the sl- screen, and these are natural questions. Was water volume constant? Now, one of the things is I know in your slides, obviously you show. What's really uh, uh, maybe if we, I can bring that up, I'm going to bring up the slides again. Um, why don't you back up to that um, graph where the exponential growth is? And I think that's um, that will help uh, answer this question for this person saying about the volumes and, and water. It's a, it's a common question, so I'll get that out of the way there. And uh, just so other people know, uh, if you look at if I understand this right, um, is the uh, the brown part? Whoops, the brown part is. Um, I'll just go to this. Right. But can, if go back here. to that graph. If you can go back to that graph and then we'll then I'll get, let you go there uh, on your explanation. But if you go to that graph, just for people to know, the blue is water, correct? No, the blue is um, mantle. The orange oh, is mantle. You know what? Is what, what if you were to map the water volume on this, it would be really, really small, I guess. Right. Yeah. Beyond scale. What? Look. I'll take over there, David. Um, um, The the seafloor crusts are essentially uh, volcanic rocks. Right. And unbeknownst to most people, the seafloor crust is actually exposed mantle. Um, You get the the basaltic lava coming up through the mid-ocean ridges and cooling at surface. That is mantle-derived volcanic right. lava so therefore that is cooled and quenched mantle oh, not, okay. not a lot of people realize that you say so you have separate continental crusts and separate oceanic seafloor so crusts. according to this graph we are at half and half right i mean we went from almost none uh, we went from that, none that's, yeah that's schematic of course uh, that day uh, and there's a bit of license there but let me finish okay. um basaltic lava or basalts in particular uh, they retain 15 to 20, I think it is white percent volatiles within their crystal lattices. And the volatiles are water and gases. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so 20, 15 to 20 percent weight by, by, uh, by volume, weight, sorry, weight. Um, once that is um, uh, reaches the surface, that those volatiles are expelled. They devolatilize. Mm-hmm. And they add to the ocean. So the answer to that question is the, the volume of the seawater has actually increased um, in time. Okay, and so in- I'm, I'm gonna, I want to I wanna clear. Yeah, oh, so what you're saying, I just want to make sure, I'll, I'll let you go again, is that you're saying, because one of the things is you see those black smokers and you see th- right. water pouring out. Is that water, yep. Yep. Par- is that's that correct. also being added to the ocean? That is the water that's being added to it along the full length of those mid-ocean ridge zones. And as well as that, there's gases to add to, add to the atmosphere and metals and all sorts of um, um, other things going with it. Sulfides, so that's coming from the mantle. And it, it's, it's coming from the, from the basaltic rocks via the, the mantle, yes. Not directly from the mantle. They're devolatilizing. It's like opening what you people call the soda pop, the pop uh, right. soft drink bottle, a can of soft drink, whatever we, you call it there. Um, you, you click the, the, the lid and whoosh, 
out well, comes the gases. Yeah. That's devolatilization. Right. And that's right. the same, very similar to what the basalts do. It happens to the basalts, the, vol the volatile elements, the gases and the water devolatilize. They um, if, uh, uh, percolate out of those, those basalts. Right, and that's one of the biggest questions people get right away because we hear in school over and over and over two things. One, mm. eh, we don't seem to be able to account to, for all the water on it. And maybe it was comets, right? Mm. But if you do calculations, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. And the other thing is what's really interesting, uh, the other question I have that's related to this, and actually I think I've never asked you this, is that it seems, it, it seems there is a balance between when, as more and more mantle gets built, new mantle gets built, this blue area, it's mm. bringing in water. But it's, it's not like, it, it, what's the ratio between the water level and the new mantle coming in? Because if there was lots of water coming in, either the sea floor, the sea is, are the seas rising or are they, are they falling during this time because of the ratio of water in that mantle? It's currently not keeping pace with increase in radius. So contrary to what um, the powers that be tell us, sea levels is actually falling rather than rising. Um, right. the, 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 the rise in sea level that they're talking about is an apparent rise. Right. And as you increase Earth radius, the continental crusts try to keep their um, uh, surface curvature. So what, you, what happens is the outer edges around the outer edges of the continents are depressed, become depressed as the central areas of each of the continents rises. Eventually that will fail and it'll re-equilibrate again. But at the moment, the outer edges are, um, are being pressed down into the mantle rocks because of this, the increase in surface curvature. And the um seawater the ocean water the levels appears it's some apparent increase in certain apparent mm -hmm. rise but but in actual fact it's a decrease okay if you go yeah, I've, 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 you can see this in reality over much uh, most of the most of the world we have here here in perth we have uh raised marine platforms three meters above present sea level and that's a thousand years ago that sea level was a th was three meters higher back in sicily where we had a conference there a good few years ago um right. the ancient port there is now uh, whereas once at one time a thousand years ago they were sailing their ships in there and uh, in their harbor and now it is three meters above sea level even in the states i noticed there along the californian coastline things like that right. so yes the the increase, the volume of water is increasing, but it's not keeping pace with the increase in, 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 in radius. Right. Now, you, you were going back to a, um, a slide before that, before I really interrupted oh, you. Oh, that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. I was going to talk to that one rather than this one, but that's all right. In, okay. my, next, in my next podcast, I will show a series of uh, uh, that same slide, but a series of them showing the distribution of... Um, uh, the ancient continental seas back in time. And you, you can see the definite increase in surface area of those seas. And then once you get rupture and breakup of the continents and introduction of this new water from the mid-ocean ridge spreading centres, there's a rapid increase in, in the volume and surface area of the waters over time. Okay. That's all, right. all I was going to say. Okay. Now, this is another question, and it brings up the, your comment that I thought that was really interesting. If I'm going to bring this up again, um, it if, is you look at, if, if you if you look at this, I was I, this just hit me during your talk. Um, if you look at this graph and you look at that 500 is 500 million years ago, right? Now you're saying that we're going to be the size of the giant gas planets. If you just take that 500 and flip it over to that side. That's, That's right. quite astonishing. Astonishing. So it you is. get a, a lot of different uh, uh, questions about this. And um, it, do, it do, other pro do other do yes, other planets do. grow? They do, and it's and it's uh, it's not a, it's not not a coincidence that the giant planets are strongly magnetic, right? Whereas the the um, 
the inner planets, the are essentially non-magnetic. So the, the the planets that are strongly magnetic and the Earth is moderately magnetic, they're the ones that's attracting these solar particles that's that, that's emanating from the sun via the the uh, solar wind. So it just seems that these giant spherical magnets called planets are attracting all this new matter, these particles, and and increasing in size and volume. So that's that's why I can confidently, confidently say that the Earth, because it's a giant magnet, spherical magnet, will, in 500 million years' time, will eventually reach the size of, of the giant planets, whereas yeah. Mercury's, the Venus's, the Mars of the planets, and even the Moon, our Moon, are essentially non-magnetic, so they're not increasing in size. So, so it also uh, bodes to the idea that uh, eventually, during that between now and five hundred million years, the Earth, that the chemical processes going on will eventually let go an immense amount of gases and things because the gas giants are, are uh, have solid cores, but they are also obviously surrounded by lots of gases. Is that something you also see or have not really spent a lot of time on? Because uh, James, you can't, every, you can't do everything. You can't do everything. I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, but it's, it's feasible. Um, most of the giant planets are shrouded in in gases, so it's logical to conclude that Earth will 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 end up that way as well. Okay, here's another question from Franklin, our uh, who has hosted these for many years. He says, "I have not seen the exponential expansion. Any idea why that would be?" Um, I'm I'm not. I mean, the I think what it means is that people thought maybe that expansion would be um, uh, linear. Ah, uh, yes, yes. I mean, obviously, um, for instance, I mean, to give an example, people know, is that 250 million years ago, the, the crust started to crack, you know, and, and before that, as you said, it was just, just an incredibly slow process. But all of a sudden, now we're heading on that curve. What would be some it, of your expert opinion about what that is? It is an interesting uh, question when, when you think about it properly. Um, and I liken that to uh, civil engineering. In civil engineering, they will do testing on steel bars and, and, and various um, aluminium, et cetera, et cetera, where they have a, a round bar or, or a, a bar of metal in, um, in, a, in a, uh, some chucks, paired uh, chucks, and then stretch it. And mm -hmm. right. they, uh, the, the, uh, before it breaks, it's, it is an exponential it forms an exponential curve, just like I've shown on mine, on, on the Earth, uh, where you get a very slow uh, atomic creep uh, starting to get uh, um, a, a stretching of the, the molecules, then, then tearing and shredding of the molecules, and then uh, uh, break up and, and, and dismembering of the, of the shreds and particles and grains of, 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 of metal. And then ultimately you get that bang. Uh, and then that's where the exponential curve goes, shows a rapid increase in, um, in, in the vertical axis. And that is roughly what I'm seeing in that exponential curve where it's a very, very long, protracted, um, very long and protracted, um, uh, a very slow rate, microns per year over of billions of years, the first two and a half billion years, uh, history, it only increase, radius only increases by 60 kilometres. Um, and by that stage, you're still looking at only uh, less than the thickness of a human hair per year increase. And then the, the, the steady increase in... Um, in the uh, gradient of that curve is where the crust is starting to to stretch the uh, sedimentary basin, uh, basins that I, I'll introduce in the next talk. They're like, you can imagine like being plasticine, they're just being stretched and stretched and stretched. And then you get to the point where, I've shown here at the 250 million year mark, where that crust cannot stretch anymore and bang, the crusts break up. Uh, and you get a rapid rise, a relatively rapid rise in the rate of uh, increase in radius over time. Um, 
this is this is uh, derived purely and simply from the um, uh, measuring the surface areas of those uh, from, of those uh, features in the geological map of the world, and that is exactly that map is exactly reproduced from that uh, from that mapping data. Okay, okay. Um, we'll put up another uh, question. Uh, this one is um, doc Dr. Maxlow. If you have looked at the uh, Hawaiian emperor chain bend 450 million million years ago in relation to your work with expansion tectonics, I'd be very interested here to know your thoughts on that bend. I'm not fully uh, familiar with being Australian. I'm not fully familiar with uh, the Hawaiian Islands, etc. But um, how can I explain it? Um, the that part of the uh, Pacific Ocean um, is a very old, old uh, uh, seafloor crustal area. The, uh, to the west of that Hawaiian chain, you get a very, very large area of Jurassic um, seafloor crusts greater than 170 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the radius of the Earth was, say, about... 60% of what it is now. So the surface curvature at that time, it's, it's like, um, I, I, I liken it to, say, um, the skull cap, the Jewish skull cap. You fit it on your head, but if you take that skull cap and put it on, say, uh, a baseball, uh, uh, not a baseball, a... Um, Having a basketball. senior smoke basketball here, <laughs> it'll sit. It'll 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 be upstanding, and so in order to maintain that surface curvature of that uh, basketball, that crust has to also stretch and distort, and surrounding that is a large area of Cretaceous uh, volcanic crusts as well. But what I'm alluding to is as well as the, the um, mid-ocean ridge, uh, intrusion of these volcanic lavas along the mid-ocean ridge, in that Pacific area, you also get fractures and cracks and whatnot in that older seafloor crust. And these form channel ways where lava can migrate to the surface and the Hawaiian chain and also the guy routes, uh, the chains of mountains throughout the, that area of the Pacific uh, are essentially leakage, volcanoes leaking from the, via the, from the mantle to the surface. The actual bend, um, the continents, are, because of the increasing um, surface curvature and, and, and area, they're constantly jostling, jostling and shuffling around anyway so in North America relative to, say, Asia is actually rotating uh, what you call counterclockwise, the North America is counterclockwise. So there is a, a rotational element in North America and the North Pacific region of that region uh, up through there, which may explain why there's a bend in that um, Hawaiian chain, as you ask. Okay, um, I'm going to be putting some more up here. Um... Um, here, here's a, a question. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm sorry, grabbing folks in, in random order. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not getting these in order. But could there be upside down mountain ridges and the hot spot hit uh, one and deflected? Is that? I think maybe there. This was related to your Hawaiian. Uh, what the question was. So upside no. down mountain <laughs> ridges. I mean, meaning meaning as is the mantle. You know, is it, it, we have the mountains on top, right? Do we have thicker parts below as well? Um, on expansion tectonic Earth, uh, mountains are not formed by collision or subduction. Right. They are formed by, well, as a professor colleague of mine, he, he's um, um, he's written quite a number of books on mountains. He's essentially a geomorphologist, uh, um, a geographer, um, and he um, studies mountains throughout the world. He and his, his another uh, professor friend have studied mountains throughout the world, and what they noticed is 
mountains are as you can see crumpling in the mountains the folding and, and thrusting and faulting etc but that is not formed by collision um, I don't want to go into it in too much detail because it's it's not controversial it's it, well it is controversial from a plate tectonic perspective but there's a different mechanism and I would actually act, have to introduce a, a number of slides to show it but essentially I'll, I'll try to if you've got crusts like this and you've got the opening of the oceans oops I'm trying to balance my hands I'm not trying to move there you go um, nope 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 there you get this effect so as the, the as the uh, surface curvature flattened it, the radius increases and the surface curvature flattens oops I'll get my fingers there we go flattens you get a uh, a flattening of the outer, surf, outer surface of the uh, continents. And this is where your mountain chains are. These are mountain chains along right. the full length of the continents. The, uh, what do you call it, Cordillerians uh, in, in the west coast of North and South America, our own um, Great Dividing Range in, in Australia, um, ancient ranges in the Appalachians uh, in um, Eastern America and Europe, etc. These are all where you get this change in a flattening of the curvature and an increase in elevation. But prior to that, when the, get it back again, the continents were together, if you get a flattening effect, you get compression in that direction. So as the continental crust flatten, as the radius of the Earth increases, that's where you get the crumpling and folding and faulting and what are then that's preserved then that parts company and here's your mountains preserved on on each of the adjoining continents so that in a nutshell is what mountain buildings or is all about having said that um you would expect some thickening along the margins of the continents uh, because that's uh where it's preserved and it's thickened prior to being uh um, uh, opening up whereas the central parts of the continent most of the continents are thin because that's where your erosion is you erode from the center out towards the margins so i hope i've sort of <laughs> answered that question <laughs> yeah well mountain uh, mountain ranges are quite controversial that is a whole difference that's sure. a whole different topic and subject in its own oh, of right. course i mean uh, the whole uh, it's it is it is fascinating subject actually because the other thing you that, have so the other thing ahead. that uh, the other thing that these professor friends have noted is most of these um mountain belts most well as you as you flatten these mountains along uh, mountain belts you then introduce erosion along these belts here and then you start getting the mountains, uh, the valleys and whatnot in, in, in there and, and erosion and et cetera. So you get plateaus. And, and then as the curvature changes again and you start to get uh, the, mar the margins depressed below sea level again, you get more sediment deposited here. So that becomes your unconformity and your plateau, plateau and unconformity. And then you get an increase again, increase again, uprise, and the whole thing cyclical. But yeah, it's quite a complex process. But it's um, it all fits in beautifully in, in expansion tectonics. There's no need well, for random wham bang crash bang um, tectonics. Well, there's also some uh, a couple of Indian scientists, right, who are going against the grain, which is the India's went sliding up and crashed in, and that formed the mountains. Um, that I, I remember that. Also, um, I saw this uh, YouTube way back of a person putting uh, sort of a mud on, t in, on a balloon and letting it sort of uh, dry a little bit. Yeah. And then when you inflate it, what you find is that the curved surfaces, when they, when they uncurve, they literally crumple. That's and correct. They That's exactly and they right. form... Yeah, uh, mountains. 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 Well, actually, right. they'll form they'll form a, a network, a network of of, uh, of belts, 
uh, like a soccer ball, like the the uh, joins of a soccer ball, the patches right. on a soccer ball. So much like that, as it first introduced by Sam Carey, fifty years. Right, ago. That he was he was the one that had that real famous um, a graphic where he showed the continents, where you had the bowl in the middle, you had the uh, forming right. of you know the United States, Australia, other places around the world where That's this right. was noticed. And he had that a soccer ball. They also had yep. one with... Um, That's what I'm I think alluding a, to, yes. Yeah, and then there was one with like a tree where that yeah. grew out and you saw the peeling of the bark and all that. And so just the mechanics, really, there's a whole side of expansion tectonics. I mean, there's just so many sides. Um, mm -hmm. Expansion tectonics affects, um, you know, looking at the mechanics, right, of what materials do when these expansions happen. There's also... Um, um, the plant flora and fauna as well and that in itself is uh, gives us a lot of clues um dennis mccarthy who's actually his expertise is in shakespeare but he gave a talk to us about in 2008 a while back about 12 years ago where he talked about um um one um i think it was a, a, a lizard or something that could not swim in the it dies he would die or something like that in the, in the salt water. And he was on one island in the Pacific and then on the South American coast. And it lined up perfectly with expansion tectonics. There was also flora that if it were to float in the water, it would die. But it, but it, it too was on these seemingly disparate areas. And it seems to me that it, when expansion tectonics is finally accept it, which it will be, it's going to change paleontology, oh, it's going to change biology, <clears throat> it's going to change physics. And this is one of the reasons I love this this whole idea of spectrum tectonics, because you can't, it, it not only breaks open uh, um, geology, it breaks open physics, cosmology, everything. It, 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 it's, you're absolutely right, and, and and I think it's my third or fourth talk, I'll be introducing um, fossil distribution throughout the uh, wor world on uh, on my models. But getting back to what you mentioned a moment ago, um, example with, um, um, I can't remember what you said, who this fellow oh, was. It was like the balloon? No, never mind. Um, back in about 95, uh, when I was doing, uh, making my models, um, I, was, I was up to uh, Jurassic, and at that time, New Zealand, prior to that, New Zealand was docked against um, the east coast of Australia, and you have the n northern end of, of New, New Zealand like that, the Bay of Islands and what, where are we, yeah. Bay of Islands, etc., up here. And anyway, um, I had an email from a fella, from a uh, fellow in um, New Zealand. Um, I think he was a professor, but he, he, he's retired now. But he's he's working with what the high up research. Anyway, he, he had his students up in this northern end, and they come across a, uh, a dinosaur vertebra. And well, actually, he, actually they did that, but he also specialised in ammonites, which are um, little fossil shells. And he came to me, he said, look, he's got a bit of a quandary because um, this particular variety of ammonite only occur in this Bay of Islands, this northern section of the, whoop, that way around, this section here of the northern end of New, Ze New Zealand and around Mexico. <clears throat> and I was in a quandary and it was perfectly timed because I, New Zealand was a bit of a floater in, in, in the Pacific Ocean. I could sort of have it a number of different ways. Anyway, when he mentioned this, I was just alluding, here, 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 we, here, we, here we have Mexico and here we have New Zealand right there. So the, the, oh my this, goodness. this side, we've got New Caledonia and all that there. Is that on Baja? Um, uh I don't, yeah, Baja, well, California, you know, because Mexico has that like, like peninsula, right? Yeah, but this is prior to that. This is the, okay, the actual pr uh, assemblage prior to all that. Uh, oh, I got you, etc. Et so, anyway, these fossils here match these fossils here, sort of thing, precisely. 
So I was very, uh, very appreciative of this fellow because he <laughs> pointed me in the right direction as to where I should put New Zealand and it fitted absolutely perfectly. <laughs> so, yes, that was a, uh, my own example, a, a really good example of what you mentioned about before about lizards not being able to, to uh, swim very far in the ocean. And here's a, a, a fossil species that uh, do exactly right. the same. Right. And you've got, of course, all that, that um, uh, the work by Stephen Hurl, who, who shows yeah. that, I mean, it, it's amazing to me how many disparate professions. Here you've got a guy who's a mechanical engineer, and he <laughs> ends up before the internet, when you didn't have all this information instantly available, even on your phone in your pocket, he was drifting toward and uh, the idea that the Earth had to be less gravity and less mass. Mm -hmm. And then he, with his calculations, run across the expansion tectonics. And it's, it amazes me. It just constantly amazes. And then that's why I get excited when I see, if you have that model in mind and you watch the um, science articles come out once in a while you get that like the Australian one right the Australia and, and Canada oh that's crazy and then uh, you start to realize if you just keep your eyes open you're going to find more and more data it's funny because instead of coming up with data that goes against it actually always helps the picture of <laughs> expansion tectonics there's another, there's another fellow here in Perth um, David Noel I don't know if you've mentioned you've come across him he is essentially a botanist, and his passion is fruit and nut trees. And he's got something like 18,000 from memory um, oh, wow. uh, locations of all these nut trees, all over uh, ancient nut trees and fossil uh, nut trees all over the world. And he came to the conclusion that the um, earth is increasing in radius over time for exactly the same reason as Stephen did, because... He was getting um, populations of, of uh, say, palm trees over here in wherever, wherever. Uh, palm trees here on one side of the world, Pacific, and palm trees over there in the other side of the world. And when you put them together with expansion tectonics, they come together. But from a plate tectonic perspective, in order to get from here to there, they have to go all the way around there. Uh, uh, or, or, or swim across or something like that. So, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's where you get those gyrations where you see, I think, what, that's why they don't do many animations because if they go back in a little bit, you've got Australia's, Australia's a big problem. I mean, besides generating radical people, thinkers like yourself, <laughs> which is already a problem, um, you, have, you have the problem of the Pacific because Pangaea, of course, has the idea that they all stick together strangely, I mean, which doesn't make sense. Why would you have a planet? I mean, I, I've never seen a planet in a fi science fiction movie where they fly by and there's one, it's all ocean except for one big island in the middle. I mean, it just, it, it doesn't, even intuitively as human beings, we're not planet builders. We get this into that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So what you have is Australia is a great example because if you match it on the East Coast and then on the West Coast, on two things that should be separated by a gigantic Pangean ocean, whatever that was called, you, uh, you, you have no way to do that. What do you do? Like move it over there for a few things and then it came back. It sort of went on a trip and then, you know. Just give me one second. Okay, no problem. So um, uh, we are here today for with um, uh, Dr. James Maxlow. If you haven't... Um, back. Uh, oh, he's back already. If you haven't... Yes. Uh, 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 read about him you should get his book um i'm going to print this up and i'm going to bring it right back of course um this book is oops, upside down this book is james maxwell beyond plate tectonics if you have not gotten and get it um down here and i'm going to do this james this is something i'm going to show everybody down here people may wonder what the heck that is well i know exactly what it is because i have in my hand here something that a lot of people probably don't know those animations, people, I think, would assume would be graphics. Here you can see North America and Australia, um, uh, South America. Um, let's see if I can get Australia on there. But this is a model made by James Maxlow. There's Australia right there. And, um, and you can see it's the same kind of thing he was moving. So what you see in that, when you see these animations going around, that's a real 
styrofoam ball, I, I think, or or something, or maybe yeah. he made his yeah, styrofoam. And yes. he has cut it out and done this by hand. So when he's call, talking about models, he's talking about real physical models. And of course, um, I think there is a project, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Isn't there a project, um, I think it's headed uh, by Stephen Hurl, that is a three-dimensional uh, globe in computer and a, a computer modeling. Is that cor correct? Yes, that's correct. You, um, tell, tell us I'm a little bit sure. about that. I'm not so sure what stage he's up to now, but there actually, there's actually a number of people, probably maybe two or three people, um, who have tried to model this uh, on the computer. And if you, if you could show that that uh, globe again, David, just show that up again. I'll show that by assembling those crusts there, uh, just turn it around to a yeah down a bit. No, no, keep going around. Yeah, a bit more, a bit more. There, so there. Start, hold it there. You can model this on on computer, um, but by the time you start getting back uh, too far back in time, the actual distortion, uh, crustal right. distortion, becomes. A little bit too complex for computers. He's done a, a, an absolutely brilliant job, um, and he, he, I think you can access uh, the work he's done on his website. Uh, uh, who is who are you talking uh, about? Uh, Stephen Hurrell. Okay, uh, Stephen Hurrell. Www. Dot. Dynox. Dynox. Dot. Com. Yeah, I have that. I can uh, get that up there. Yeah. Something like that. Right. Uh, and I think you can. I think you can access that and you still access it used to be able to uh, and he works he's working on it um steadily uh, there he is um uh, he's been working on that for quite some time but but you can only do that for the um probably the past maybe 100 million years of crusts confidently by the time you get further back than that it starts to get a bit more complicated because of the distortion factor in the crust. Yeah, so, I think I think yeah. what's going to happen. Yeah, what's going to have to happen because I'm a computer scientist myself. We're going to have to eventually get computer scientists to to know how to model oh, yeah. it. And the, yeah, and the way yeah. you're going to have to do it is going to be different from the way it's done now. I think a lot yeah. of times right now it's more like laying um, um, graphics on top of a spherical object. And I think yeah. what we're going to need to do is literally make what we call wire frames wire for frame for the um, the surface, just like where you see here. Um, you're going to see wire. We can make those into wire frames. And as things get smaller, we can then adjust where those those edges go as well. So it's not going to. It's it's. I think it's very difficult to try to make it into how do you say a physicality, so that you just put the 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 um how do you say put the continents there and as you grow it the the computer program will figure out how to make those smaller i think we're just going to have to eventually have it so that people um, the way i envision it you would have this the the global earth where you can then move those things so when you get to a certain point you can actually move the the edges if you need to do that because of the way things would be and we'll have to use more of our brains to do that because you know to model that physically and give it physics would be really hard and then at that time i think what would we would be able to do is well, then we could start mapping the the flora and the fauna so that awesome. when you get to a, get to a certain point uh, in in the history, you'll understand, and people who are uh, paleontologists will understand. Oh, this could have been one of the reasons the dinosaurs died off is because that cracking and made the herds and the different ways that they would migrate. These things will affect just like the guy with the nut trees, right? He'll be able to go and say, I think he'd love it. He'd be able to go into the model and start making his own uh, world there. That is, you could go in and make a layer and he could start putting all the nut trees and all the, the floor that he's found and not, and not only map it, but map it on the, the, the changing. I mean, that would just be fantastic. It's not well, an easy so, problem. We got to find funding for it. You, you, that's you right. <laughs> With the amazing, the amazing stuff that um, the uh, movie people do with their graphics and animations and stuff, to them, to me, uh, what you're talking about there would be 
bread and butter, just very simple process for people. Well, yeah, it's. Yeah, I, 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 I don't want to burst your bubble, but it is different. It'd have to be different <laughs> sure. because because what happens the way they do it is very different. It wouldn't be amenable to this. I know a lot about computer graphics, so but it's yeah. not hard what we're talking about. So the graphics that we're talking about in the in the way to do this, you would just basically first come up with a model where you would start at today go down and what we would do is allow geologists or yourself to go in there tweak around with the surface uh you know so all of these things would that are drawn here they would be line segments and yeah. those line segments could be tweaked and as they go down and go down and then once everyone's happy with those those line segments and the way things are then you would then allow people to go in and log in, create their own account, start putting mappings on there of right. flora and fauna mm -hmm. and geology, all kinds of things. And then that person would only do it not only for that period, but another period. So then you could go in as a student and say, I want to look at what happens to the nut trees from this size to this size and watch what happens. And people can write dissertations on that. They, I mean, it's just, it would be incredible. So it would be definitely a, its own kind of, own kind of it thing. Is, it is, it is fascinating. It is, you're absolutely right, David. Um, in, I think my third and fourth presentation, I'll, I'll be introducing uh, data, exactly what you're talking about. Um, I um, manually plotted, I think, 10,000 um, ancient pole uh, measurements on my globes and about 9,000 fossils wow. all over the world on these wow. globes. Um, and that's, you can see that, you can see the outcomes of that, uh, that, um, research on my my website there's some interactive some lovely interactive um, uh, models there which show that show that exactly what you're talking about in, uh, yeah in i think I, I think what needs to be done is, is just for people to know um let me go up here um uh, expansion tectonics.com if you go to that you can read your um uh you read about uh, that's your website correct you own yes, that yes that's great. And James Maxlow, if anybody on, on planet Earth, expanding Earth should own it, it's you. But uh, I'm helping them. I'm, I'm, my, my goal is the expansion tectonicists have been talking like this, and I welcome them over to us because we have a, a bigger audience to get people uh, interested. But for our website that we have now, I'm going to be working with the uh, expansion tectonicists group to uh, put up a website very similar to the community website we have. And the idea there is that we're going to, I think we can do is you, we can make a group in that, on that new website, one of the groups, because you can make groups. And that group should be discussing how we can software wise do this project. Um, because I think what we need to do is come up with a way in a, in a program to do it or look at what we have and get other people involved, try to get you know more people involved as a community project. So I think that's something uh, we can look forward to um, uh, with the new group. So you guys, uh, tell us a little bit about, um, you guys have been meeting and I, I've been watching that and you are using Zoom and um, I'm gonna be talking with your group to use this platform. And, and this is one of the reasons I'm having you over here today, because during this time we've had anywhere from 25 to 30 people live. So I mean, this is not, you know, and those people are coming in and out. This would mean they're searching on Google and all of a sudden they come across, who's this guy talking about it? So we're really trying to get you guys more into, you know, the way things are working today. But you guys have a group of people. Tell us a little bit about your group that has been meeting uh, online, especially with COVID. Tell us about what that, who that, who they are, um, what kinds of things are going on in the expansion tectonics world. There's probably uh, ten or a dozen global global distribution. We have two fellows in Poland, one in England, three or four in the States, myself here in 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 Australia, uh, one in Italy. Uh, I think a friend in in Africa. So we we're quite a a widely spaced group. But what I find is, for example, whenever we get together on conferences, international conferences, for example, um, we um, 
we're people that are pushing our own wheelbarrows, so to speak. We have our own agendas. We have our own research projects. They don't necessarily um, necessarily overlap and coincide with what other members are uh, are doing. Um, and by getting together like this, we're slowly uh, slowly starting to mellow and, and cooperate. And um, we've only just started to uh, have these podcasts um, and really we're a bunch of amateurs in that respect. We're quite professional <laughs> in, 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 the, in the sciences, but typical sure. scientists, you know, to, to get your stuff out communicated is, is the difficult part. Actually doing the, start, doing the science is, is relatively easy by comparison. So coming across the likes of you, David, as, as you well know, I've, I've known you for many, many tens of well, decades, actually. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, and uh, you, you've been an absolute boom to, to, uh, to, to us. And we're looking forward to uh, joining uh, forces with you to, uh, yes. to guide us and direct us in the right direction and to uh, tap into your, um, your valued uh, member base as well. So, yeah, we're look, quite looking forward to that. Yeah, and, 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 and what, go ahead. bearing in mind, sorry, we're all rather elderly <laughs> right, now. Right, right, um, Most of us are around about my age plus, uh, sure. and we're retired. Most of us are retired, and um, it's a sort of a well, not a well-known, but a, a bit of a comical joke in in the sciences. If you don't agree with somebody, if somebody's um, right. causing problems in the profession you just wait till they die they are afraid right but unfortunately they've all died off and but we're uh, rapidly <laughs> <laughs> well it is so, yeah so i mean it, to sort of capture all this and now yes all this. <laughs> yes it's really it's really important because you know, the cmp i started with the dissident science i met a a, a gentleman a dr carazani who uh, showed Einstein wrong back in the 1940s. And that's how I got into all this. The next thing I knew and I looked at it, I go, yeah, this, is, this has got a lot of problems. And I got into it, but I've been around then since these dissidents for oh, 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 almost 30 years. It was 1992. So 2002 will be almost, it will be 30 years that I've been around people. And the NPA, which is now this organization called the CMPS, We've lost a lot of people, and it's sad. Uh, Ron Hatch, for instance, who um, was really instrumental in getting the word out, especially about relativity, because he had 30 patents in GPS. And he's yeah. saying to everybody, folks, we don't use it. It doesn't work. And <laughs> when, when you got a guy who's got, you know, everybody says, well, what do you know about it? You're saying that. But the theoreticians sit in their little, little cubes in their universities writing little diagrams of how they think it should work, you know, <laughs> according to general relativity. And therefore, yeah, this is work. They just don't know what they're doing. But um, so, so yeah, you ha but the problem is, is that even the dissidents themselves, eventually those generations are changing. The good news is that I can tell you, uh, and I think it's good because a lot of you are still have many years left, is that getting into what we're doing and how we're doing it today does bring in new blood. Mm -hmm. um, I, a, a really good example of that is somebody who we, my father and I met, because my father and I have a model of the universe, which actually, one of the things I've asked you about is the, um, when you draw those, the one diagram I, I see that you draw is you draw um, arrows into the earth. Well, the magnetic field has a direction. So one of the things is, is if you notice when you look at a globe, and this is one I think I've talked with you, is that this, if you turn a globe over, which I have up here, um, I'm not going to get it. It'll all fall down on me. But if you look at a globe, anybody take a globe, turn it upside down, and notice how much land mass is at the southern hemisphere versus the northern. Now, one of the, our model says that, that magnetic flows are actually flowing particles themselves. They're actually what we call the electrons themselves, but that's flowing. Now, if it's the case that it's, it's flowing, it's going to go more in one direction. So the mass that's gained is going to be more in one direction. Well, it seems it's not coincidental that the southern hemisphere, so that means is, has the magnetic field go, been going in different directions. Now, w when we were talking about this, a young man came along and was really intrigued by our model, and he got in, and he is maybe in his 30s, 
So uh, uh, he is extremely interested. Now he's seeing all this other stuff. He's seeing this. Now he's seeing expansion tectonics. So what we're doing is bringing in new people. The critical thinkers are out there. But we've got to get ourselves, like you said, one of the things we need to do is join forces. One of the critics I have is, uh, says to me, Dave, the only thing is you support all theories, even if they're wrong. And I go, wait a minute. That's the way we need to do it. The reason we don't go forward is we don't let people uh, uh, argue. If I had a student who was a younger student and they said they want to show the earth is flat, I would say, go for it. Because what they're going to do is they're going to try to, to, to show that. But that they're going to have to argue it, and it does. And, and people don't understand. I, I remember when I was a math student at Ohio, uh, Ohio State University, I tried to solve an insoluble problem that was only the uh, length of a lisp and the ellipse and you know the length. Well, you can only do that in a um, uh, an infinite series. Well, I tried to prove otherwise. I didn't do it. But what I learned in doing that was invaluable. And the reason we don't go and listen to expansion tectonics is a person, if my, like myself, wants to go to university, get a degree in di- di- uh, 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 geology and say, I want to do my thesis on expansion tectonics. It's going to happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the good thing is what you're saying is, is what we're trying to do, too, is let's join forces. Um, and not only that, we have specific groups. We have the structures group, which is a really great group, which talks about structures. You put like spheres together. How come the, how come the structure of the molecules in rocks? Why do they stay together? Why are some more stable than others? There are people that's all structure. And we have a whole group that's involved there. So we're trying to, as a group, I'm helping them with their website. We're tr- I'm helping you guys with your website. And we, we cross-fertilize in the sense of getting you guys over here so that people in our group, they didn't even know it. We have a lot of new people, James, that are watching us now on YouTube and on our group in our new website that looks more like Facebook, which young people like. They're all of a sudden saying, "Oh, there's this expansion." I didn't, I didn't know that. I know it was in 2008. Uh, I saw the or 2005 or between 2005 and 8. I saw Neil Neil um, uh, Adams videos, yeah. and that's Neil. how I, yep, and that's how I got in. So the good news is to tell you, James, and all your friends who are in the older generation, which are the ones who usually stand up to the mainstream, unfortunately. But we have a couple of things, and that is we have the means to get out to everybody now, and that's what we're trying to do as a CMPS's job, is to make sure we open our arms to people doing serious work outside of mainstream. If you've got a model of the universe and you're working diligently on it and you have good ideas and there's math and you write a book, we're going to support you. The, who's going to pick? The world will pick what is working. Science, humanity will finally say, no, play tectonics isn't the right way. Expansion tectonics is, and that will happen. But it is happening. Now, another question I, uh, I want to think I want to talk to everyone about here is we are starting our university. Um, we've started it in 2018. Well, we, we had that idea. And now we have people starting to write courses. This course, these courses are online. You can do it. Even a person like James and the older generation can do it. My dad's writing a course on it, James. He's 83. I think yeah. he's beaten you in the age group. So no, yeah. no. Uh, so um, one of the things really important that you're talking about of this generation, let's look at where you are in your career, right, James? You've gone through, you've written the definitive geological book for the next couple hundred years. It's here. Now, what do you need to do? You've got to teach it to people. Mm -hmm. Because one of the differences between a book and a course is that you can walk a person through a course and then quiz them, right? Mm -hmm. You can say, you can give them a a, a test, a quiz, and say, okay, you've now learned about um, um, uh, uh, mountain building as, as a lesson, right? Now you can ask them questions because now you're going to go away with that. And then you're going to be able to not only read it and get in your mind, but you, you make sure as a student that you literally, as a teacher, you quiz them. You give them, a, okay, how about this? 
What would you do? Or answer these questions. So I, I'm really hoping, and I talk to you, and you seem to be interested. Oh, we yes, can, um, we yeah. can do this online. Look, mm. it's happening with or without us. And the good thing is, is the brick and mortar is starting to crumble. You know, people are getting real degrees, uh, match, uh, bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees online. Now, yeah, we don't have the ability to say that necessarily you get a PhD, but we can make courses that are that way. And eventually, our university can then, will get enough people there that it will become a real university, in my opinion. And the difference between this university and every other one on the planet is that if you want to come in and write your PhD thesis on how the Big Bang is wrong, you are absolutely welcome to do that. Now, you have to argue your arguments, which is great. So you are, you are uh, interested. Have you ever thought about uh, teaching a course in it or what you would do? Um, I'm very interested in, in uh, how you're structuring it, yes. Um, online type stuff, but uh, actually teaching it um, openly at universities, I, I would never be accepted. Exactly. But, you're, but the thing is, today... You can be an accept, accepted. Mm. And we know. Um, I have my house. I just moved into it. And there's all kinds of things I got to do here and never did before. What do I do? I go to the Internet. And I get <laughs> to be able to do things that I none of us could have done by ourselves before unless it was trial and error. So, mm. you know, the idea of actually the found, we founded it in 2018. It's a John Chappelle University for nat, and you get natural f degrees in natural philosophy. Natural philosophy is what was called physics, but it, it encompasses everything. Natural philosophy is what are the systems in nature, right? That's what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm really happy to hear you that because we've got it on. Um, I'm much looking forward to it, yes. Yes. So um, I know we have Ian there. Hey, Ian, I know you're sort of sitting there. Uh, did you want to come on and, and make any comments? Um, uh, it would be interesting maybe to bring you up um, and just say hello. Um, uh, maybe Are you new to, would, would that be okay with you? I think Ian Cohen, he has been here on the, uh, I really admire him. He's from England. He's a really uh, sort of a big thinker. Uh, I've, I've heard him speak. Um, would you like to come on and maybe uh, make a comment and what, you, what you've seen? with and here with uh, uh, what James has been talking about in Spanish Tectonics. So I'm going to add you to the stream. Hey, Ian. Uh, well, well, thank you very much, um, uh, David and James. My, uh, my fellow countrymen would, would be somewhat um, upset with you in saying that I come from England. I actually come from Ireland. <laughs> but anyway, um, I suppose they're both equidistant from, from um, North America and, and uh, Australia. That's the same. Yes, I think on a previous occasion, maybe it was um, the, the Hurrell talk that I, I did uh, confess that I was rather new to this subject, but um, I found it quite fascinating. And I, I think I have an open mind uh, on the matter. I, I haven't really um, made up my mind about it. Um, I, I took a few um, uh, notes which were very specific. Um, I, I might take the opportunity, uh, with your permission, of mentioning them, and, and perhaps uh, James can... Uh, can can, uh, can respond. Um, I, I, the, the point um, uh, perhaps has been dealt with, but I noticed at the beginning of your lecture, James, you you said something about oh, in the nineteen sixties, um, you know, w w when the view was about continental drift. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, um, you know, in the intervening period, has um, has has that been? less pronounced in, in the mainstream and, and maybe, you know, is it more amenable to your ideas? Um, I, I don't know, perhaps I'll go through these few points since I have the, the floor. Um, you know, I, I also commented uh, or, or I noted that, um, you know, the, the exponential growth and, and the, the, you know, the extrapolation to 500 million years, hence, you know, that we, we might have the same diameter as maybe Jupiter or something like that. Um, I, I'm just wondering, have you um, looked at further, further, further uh, uh, field? I, I mean, you know, obviously this exponential growth does go off to infinity. And, you know, if one extrapolated this to uh, eons in the future, you know, would other factors come in to, um, you know, uh, uh, mitigate the expansion ad infinitum? Um 
the the other point which which might have brought uh, you know uh, came to mind uh, in relation to that was that if these um, particles from the sun are uh, you know, going all over the place I into the planets. Uh, obviously, the sun is getting smaller. So, would your estimation be in excess of you know the conventional estimation, uh, just of the loss of of material um, from the nuclear fusion of the sun? Um, well, so, sorry to be putting all these points. About half a dozen of them or so. The other point was uh, wh where you look at. Um, I think one of the questions was. Um, you know, is this happening to other planets? And you conceded that, that it was. But I'm just wondering, is uh, the sort of time constant of the other planets different? Like, you know, uh, as you say that um, um, in 500 million years, we, we, we'd be about Jupiter's size or something. Um, and I'm wondering, because of the different constitutions of the other planets, I mean, um, you know, you have sort of quasi-terrestrial planets, maybe the, the inner planets, and the outer planets are gaseous planets. So, you know, would they have a quite a different time constant? In other words, would they be growing at a much uh, slower or, or a much a much faster rate? Um, uh, also, what, one thing is you, you, you talked, you kept on talking about the radius of the Earth, you know, uh, increasing radius and so on, uh, obviously on the assumption of, of, of it being spherical. But since it's an oblate spheroid, I'm just wondering, um, in your model, over over these large periods of time, uh, is the uh, ellipticity um, changing? Uh, you know, it, it, is the ratio between the uh, semi-major and semi-minor axes remaining constant, or or is is the Earth getting more spherical or less spherical? Um, th those are the, the very specific questions. I I, I must concede that I. Um, I meant so you might want to say a word about them. I'd be most interested. Okay. <laughs> um, with regard to the sphericity issue, I think no, I haven't. I haven't looked at that, and I don't think it can be modelled at all back in time at all. But um, it's an interesting point because I think that the uh, oblate spheroid uh, shape of, at the moment may be. Um, how can I explain it? Um, I can do it with my hands. Where I just there we go. Um, way back in the Permian, we got opening up of the Pacific Ocean, and then starting to open up the Atlantic Ocean, and then the an Indian Ocean, an Arctic Ocean like this. So, I think the that's where you, you're you're a bloat. Uh, the spheroid comes into it where you're getting more continental crust on one side and 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 so on and so forth um getting back to your the planet itself um an exponential curve of course you're simply changing one axis to that axis you you eventually hit that you you i seem to be back to front here you're, you're, you're flat lying and then a rapid increase. So that's where, to me, that's where time changes direction. And what, where that direction goes and heads off, I don't know, of course. But it's an interesting point. Um, I always, I always view, visualize the Earth as a transition between the rocky inner planets and the gaseous giant planets. And I, I also envisage, say, the asteroid belt as maybe a failed planet. So at some stage, um, this particular planet may have increased in size, but not being as gaseous as the giant planets and the Earth are, it may have failed and fragmented and simply crumbled up and you're getting a, a, an asteroid belt. Because this goes against uh, cosmology and, and astrophysics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's just something that I, I, I contemplated about, um, and I can't even remember any of your other questions. But that, there's but there's one point that both of you it's interesting because I had seen I've talked about this with other people mm -hmm. even ten years ago. Now, if you look at we are a rocky planet going to a gaseous one, sort of like going to a Jupiter. Now, if you look at Jupiter, here here's here's something to blow your mind, Ian. This is one of the ideas. The idea is as these things are expanding and they're doing it in different rates. If you look at Jupiter, let's just look at Jupiter and pretend we don't have the Earth, okay? It's got a lot of moons, right? 
those moons are growing as well. In fact, one of those moons, I don't know if it's Saturn or Jupiter, uh, astronomy and astronomers and NASA said they have, they know it's growing. Okay. And so they don't admit it. They don't right, admit right. It, well, no, but they've said it. That, NASA's said it. Yeah. yeah but, that, but, but, but that, that's sorry, that Ganymede, um, Ganymede, there's two of them. The ice planet, right, uh, is a Ju classic example. You're getting all the fractures, right. the initial fractures, is what is, in my next talk I will be introducing fracture, global fractures. Uh, on the early Archean Earth, and that I see those fractures, and I see the initial stages of uh, expansion of that particular moon. The classic example of fracturing uh, uh, due to increasing radius, but right. of course plate tectonics won't won't accept that. They won't consider right. that. But the, what I, the point I was going to make is that as Jupiter gets bigger, the idea here's I'll just tail it right off. Jupiter will get so big it's going to ignite turn into a star and all the, the moons turn into planets. Hmm. That is one of the things I've heard. Now, how hmm. long that would take? Would it really happen? Because most of the star systems in the galaxy, a majority of them are two or more stars. That is, that's a fact. We know that now. That when we look in the sky, we think it's all, all those. The sun is a very, how do you say, it's, not, it's abnormal. Now, if it's the case that if you have a Jupiter and then for some reason it ignites and starts up and then you have those planets and then the sun is, goes the other way. I mean, who knows? It is an interesting thought, Ian. I, I mean, I that's... think, David, already that Jupiter is actually um, giving off more energy than it's receiving. It's sort of a quasi sun. It's giving right. off a very small amount of energy. Right. And then so it, I'm not saying that this is right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying... People have talked about it. So that's that's an interesting uh, point that I think people make. I think the other thing is, too, is um, when when you were mentioning, uh, Ian, about the plate tectonics in the 1960s, I mean, uh, James can talk about that a lot more. 1960s was really pivotal in this whole tectonics area because at that point they were literally in the 1960s. If you look at... Um, um, Hurl's latest book, they literally had in was Nature or Time magazine or something like that had in it or Life magazine had in it expansion tectonics in the sixties. Called uh, uh, expanding Earth, called, called right? Expanding Earth. Exactly. So in, in Ian in the sixties, they were really contemplating that, and then there was something that happened between that and the next decade that completely wiped off. The idea of expanding Earth, and and my my own feeling, and maybe James can he's much more expert, but my own feeling, the reason why was people were way too uncomfortable with the idea that the Earth was expanding. I think people just emotionally could not grasp that. Do you have some uh, thoughts on that uh, yeah, that, that transition? That, that, that's exactly right, David. Um, the other thing is um, at that time. Um, global data was in its infancy, and I always, I always, 1967 is when uh, I was in late high school, just just prior to university. And my, I recall my father gave me my first slide rule, so that was the state of the art at that time, slide rules in 1967, and. Plate tectonics was, uh, sorry, yeah, plate tectonics was introduced in, I think, uh, 65 or 66 in an era where slide rules were normal. And, of course, of course the scientific universities, et cetera, they had their uh, primitive uh, computers and whatnot. But the amount of data available at the time was just nowhere near as, 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 as volume-wise as it is now. And the, and the computing ability was nowhere near what it is now. So um, while there were there were a number of people who were seeing the raw data coming up from the the seafloor crusts, etc., uh, seeing that in in and and uh, contemplate or considering an expanding Earth, and I don't use that term expanding Earth now because it's sort of a dirty word now these days. That's why I introduced expansive tectonics. But they were contemplating an expanding Earth for, to 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 um, 
to justify to, to explain this data that was was this enormous amount of data that was coming up from the from the um, the, the oceanographic stuff. Anyway, um, people just could not contemplate. They they were only just coming to grips with that's right the fact that continents could move right to take it to that next step. I to remember visualize you saying that. It moving because the Earth is expanding. That was. I got you. I remember. I remember and, that. Yeah, I remember and there was you said that. Just a few people said, no, nope, can't be happened. Can't it, it, it's just impossible. The rocks and they also considered the continental crust, for example, was considered as solid rock. So how can you uh, change the shape and expand solid rock? Um, those ideas have all changed now. But what I what I find is <clears throat> and since then, or well, prior to that, there was a a number of uh, researchers, um, uh, um, Ott Christoph, which, yeah, is a number in the 30s. There was a, a researcher who, came, who modelled um, uh, expanding Earth. He made models, and then Klaus Vogel in the uh, 70s and 80s to into the 90s, he made his own. He made models, and with Klaus. Um, his modelling coincided with the, the first introduction of global geological mapping. And I, 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 my work started in the early to mid 90s, where this mapping that I keep alluding to on my, my slides, uh, that, was, that came into being in 1990. So uh, in 1995, I visited Klaus in his home in, in, in East Germany and we and I took my early models, not these ones, the earlier ones, uh, with me, and we compared and contrast, and they were virtually identical, as they should right. be. Sure, sure. So if you have the modern data, if you have the sure. the modern mapping data, anybody sure can do it, and they come up with identical. Stuff. Well, you're going to because the map. Look, we literally have a map of. <laughs> How the Earth expanded. I mean, you have you, you can't go against it. You there's there's no logical way. But prior to that, prior to the '60s, that 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 mapping wasn't available. Right. So um, so the people that were mo the scientists that were modeling and expanding Earth were doing it visually. They they right. were grabbing chunks here and chunks there and joining it here and your multiple plate fit options. And then, of course, um, paleomagnetics came along with their paleopole data and they were able to generate parent polar wander paths. And they had some confidence in locating and assembling these crusts using uh, parent polar wander data. And, uh, but, but unfortunately, they're, they're stuck in a rut. That's, that's yeah. what they use to quantify their assemblages even to this very day, and they just don't use geology. I, I've seen some of their assemblages where they start off using this geological map and then they get to the next model and there's no mapping. They don't use any mapping of the it seas disappears, because it know. doesn't fit. Yes, it doesn't. It just yeah. doesn't fit. It doesn't. You only have to go back ten million years, and and the data. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, screwed, you're screwed right there. You're screwed right there. Screwed right. Up. That's right. Yeah. Um, so they turn a blind eye to this geological information, and as I think I alluded to in my talk, most of these paleomagneticians are physicists or geophysicists. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In their own right, there's very few who have uh, geology. So basically, so on. basically, you want to understand. In fact, that that was it. for those, um, especially. I'm going to switch just to me here. Um, for those who want to learn about the history of Earth expansion, this book is a gem. I know Jim thinks that too. This is the, what what um, uh, Stephen Hurl did to put together all the people who have been working on Earth's expansion over the last decades. This is just this is a gold mine. In fact, this is one of the things we need to teach. I'm going to talk with Stephen Hurl to teach a course in this, the history of Earth expansion. And I think one of one of the things that he, I re now remember is that in the early 1960s, like you said, the older guard, who were the people in charge and looking at the plates and all that, 
they were getting bombarded by this new idea that they would even move at all, let, let alone their expansion. Right. And then they were getting all this data. And then on top of it, they're going to have to explain not only they're moving, but the Earth's expanding. That was too much for them. It was gotcha. too much for them. But obviously it wasn't too much for everybody, right? Because other people hung on to it and those people who, was, who still hung on to it, um, they, they went. Now, here's a good, here's an interesting question. Before We're, we're coming up on like six minutes left here. But um, in the area of physics, for instance, relativity, and when I made my movie Einstein Wrong in, in 2005, I had my mom, she, I took her on a journey to meet all these scientists. I had my mom call up all the universities. And all she did was say, I want you to find a person who's an expertise in relativity. I gave her 50 universities a call, put, put my camera on the tripod, have her turn it on. And she, she, she went on talking. We couldn't find any. Nobody is an expert. No one makes a living. There's only one person on the planet who makes a living. His name's Kip Thorne. He's like 174 years old and he won a Nobel Prize because they slipped him in on that whole, you know, gravity wave stuff. But you call up universities. No one specializes in it. And yet Einstein is supposedly the biggest guy in the world. There's no one writing theses on them. There's no uh, industry really using it. GPS doesn't use it. Um, NASA doesn't really use it. People say they do. So I'm imagining what's happening. In, in fact, in my movie, the, the advanced physics class in Long Beach, California, skipped for all 43 pages of relativity. And I asked the guy why. He says, no one cares about it. Is it the case, is plate tectonics in the universities slowly dying because they, they are so lost and that it's, it's really academic. generational? It's buried in academia. And, and in all my 40 years of professional geology um, experience, I have never used plate tectonics at all. And, and all, none of my colleagues or, or uh, the, the young people use plate tectonics. It's just like exactly what you you mentioned with, with relativity. relativity. Yeah. It's just there in the background. It's just part of the course. So you just got to accept it, right? And right. and put up with it. And no, no. It here's a, but here's a really good question. Now we can end it because this is the practical side. Does Dr. James Maxlow, the geologist, now use expansion tectonics? Tonics, and I know you're not you're not working anymore, but in your mind, you're doing geology. That's you can't help it. If I walked out with you to the Grand Canyon, believe me, we, you would be standing there for an hour on, on one part of the rock. When you are doing that in your mind is I, expansion I tectonics I, is expansion tectonics part of that thought process now? Oh, it definitely is. And, uh, it, it's an interesting point, because if I had this information back in the say 1960s, uh, 60s, 70s, where there was a boom, boom in um, exploration, I would be an ultra billionaire by now because I would have been able to highlight pick, right all where these these um, world class gold, copper, da 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 deposits wow. are throughout the world. The problem I find is when I plot all these. Uh, locations on my globes, they've already been found. <laughs> it was just randomly found, right? Yeah. Oh, that's not good. Not only not only did expansion tectonics go by the wayside, but your wealth uh, became, it just was your chance of being ultra rich has gone away. But having said that, of course, uh, bio, uh, uh, biogeography, geography, and climatology and all that are all applicable to to what, I, uh, what I'll be showing you in the next um, couple of three uh, podcasts. I'll be, detail I'll be showing you examples of all of these. Right. And it all fits together. It's, it's brilliant stuff, you know, when you put it all together on, on a proper model. Yeah, well, listen, this is always a, a conversation that I could go on and on, but my daughter has her birthday parties coming up for two days, and if I don't get off of this, I'm going to be in the doghouse. But it was a great pleasure to talk with you. I can sit and talk with you for hours and hours at end. I will say again, and I do this, and it's really sad, 
but I, in some sense, it's great, is that I want to tell you, you are recognized by many people in the science community, critical thinkers as one of the great current th critical thinkers of all time in geology, if not the, the, the best. And I mean, it's not something you set out to do, um, but I, I think one of the things that you have that I have and many other people have is the, no one's going to tell me what truth is. I need to find that out for myself. You can tell me in a school, you can tell me over and over, you can teach it in every class in the land. But if things don't point to that and point to something else, then I'm not going to listen. And I think that's what you did. And thank goodness you did. And I really look, we look forward to more talks with you. Uh, in the coming weeks, um, uh, we'd like and we look forward to building the community, the Expansion Tectonics website and getting that as a, a vibrant community like what we're doing. Uh, I really appreciate your confidence in what we're doing here. And um, I, uh, again, want to want to thank you. We did give you a Lifetime Achievement Awards and that, and that was uh, certainly well, well uh, deserved. So thank you very much. And uh, what can we look forward to in uh, coming talks? Oh, look at that. It's just turned midnight. <laughs> <laughs> so it's tomorrow. We're going to, we're not going to get you, you have to finish here, finish here. What, what, well, what, what can we expect from your talks? My next talk, I'll be um, uh, showing you modeling continental crusts. And this has never, ever been done at all uh, in, in, throughout history. So this is what I'll show you here is absolutely unique uh, one off. Uh, from that, I'll start to then start to drape um, what I call global observational data, data from um, geophysics, uh, uh, climate, uh, ge geography, biogeography, fossils, et cetera, et cetera, draping these on my models to show you the distribution and how they fit, uh, how they all fit. Well, the, the, the primary aim during my PhD research days, of course, you come up with a mod set of models, but if your data doesn't fit, your models are wrong. So right. what I did was I used the, the data to quantify the models, and they definitely quantified the models. So what I'll be doing is highlighting this in these next uh, three talks. Yeah, and I think what's going to be great is all these things that you're doing are perfect uh, segues into putting together a course. So a person could could basically go through and learn this stuff in depth. And I think that's just going to be absolutely fantastic. I see many people in your position who are great minds. Glenn Borkert on Infinity, yourself in geology. Uh, we have uh, people in structures. We have uh, uh, people in other areas that are, are uh, people with models. So uh, again, thank you so much. Um, I do have a person who says um, they, they're good at graphics. Um, Dr. James, this guy's person's Dryas. So uh, Dryas, if you want to help out, if anybody wants to help out with anything, um, I'm sure it will be welcomed by everyone. Um, get in contact. You can go to expansiontectonics.com uh, right there. Get a hold of, of um, James, anybody who wants to help or join in. Uh, James will be, he has promised, be uh, getting registered and signed up for our site so he can get his uh, feet wet in there and uh, answer any questions that we have because we do have a group and in, in on that site. If you haven't been there, uh, let me put those sites up here uh, for everybody to see. Um, that's, uh, oh, those are not it. I'm sorry. That's our YouTube channels. Uh, naturalphilosophy.org is where our community is, and you can uh, discuss things, uh, hopefully, with uh, James. He'll be on there in the next couple days. And then if you want to read about something, you can go to Science Woke. And also, for those people who don't know, James has written, I'm, I forced him, I uh, got some of my strong men in Australia who were pretty uh, mean dudes to get him to do this. But if you go to wiki.naturalphilosophy.org, it has an encyclopedic entry, a Wikipedia entry for expansion tectonics. It's the best on the planet, of course. That's what our Wikipedia is for. And believe it or not, our Wikipedia is closed because the moment you open it, the people who will, they want consensus. They don't want critical thinking. So if you want to take a look at that, James, again, thank you so much. Um, we're going to end this, um, bring you down here. And uh, we'll be having James uh, come out, coming up in the following weeks. I'm not sure which week because we have 
many people lined up. We have uh, Steve uh, Stephen uh, Bryant, who wrote Disrupting Physics. Uh, he's getting ready to come on uh, our Saturday mornings here. If you are a person who has something to talk about, uh, we're lining up. We're already through, probably done through uh, uh, October, already into November. Please get in contact with us. Uh, you'll be welcome here if you're doing serious science and people in mainstream aren't listening to you. And I want to thank all my subscribers from Dissident Science uh, YouTube channel and, of course, all the members of the CMPS who support this. If you uh, want to support us, go on, go to our website at naturalphilosophy.org. You can sign up and you can actually pay an annual membership as, thing, as, as modest as $35 all the way up. And we do have people doing that because these things, including this broadcast, our websites, the servers they're on, and all the things that benefit our community are paid through by our community. And if they don't like the job I'm, I'm doing, they can get rid of me. So, which would my wife would probably like. But um, I do want to thank everybody. I want to thank again uh, Franklin Hugh and the group that has been doing this for the last couple of years, keeping this alive. Uh, it's been great, um, greatly appreciated. And I invite everybody to remember to be critical thinkers and to not not let us tell you what is is good or important or true. You have to figure it out yourself. If you, if you want to read about expansion tectonics, uh, the book on that is, again, the uh, Beyond Plate Tectonics by James Maxlow. That is the book, the best book in geology I think ever written. And if you want the history of it, which, again, I'm going to get Stephen Hurl to write a course in that, so you can take the history of expansion tectonics uh, at our university. Uh, you'll uh, you'll uh, be able to do that in the next uh, coming year. Uh, we are actually, I'm putting the software together for it, commercial software to do that. And if you have a theory or, or a paper or anything uh, that you want to uh, uh, talk on, you get an hour on this channel uh, every Saturday morning. It broadcasts live across 4,000 subscribers on YouTube and many hundreds on Facebook page. And that is constantly growing. Uh, we can give you that platform to talk and then you'll be an inter interact. So I uh, thank you and thank everybody with the comments here uh, today. Uh, greatly appreciated. And we're going to end this broadcast. And everyone, stay critical, stay thinking. I'm Dave D. Hilster. I'm your science therapist. Ciao for now. <laughs>